Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome uh, back to our afternoon session. My name is Alexandria Russell, and I am the postdoctoral fellow for the Scarlet and Black Project here at Rutgers University. It's my pleasure to welcome you back again. All of our Zoom webinar sessions will be recorded, and we have closed captioning and a live transcript available at the bottom of your screen. We are already off to a great start and have had so many in the audience join us from all over New Jersey. We have people from Philadelphia, Virginia, and even Ocean City, Maryland, where I would like to be this weekend. Please let us know where you're joining us from in the chat. And remember, you can enter all your questions in the Q&A box. Both are available at the bottom of your screen and you will have the opportunity to unmute your microphone and ask questions directly to our panel. Now, I would like to uh, also mention that we're proud to announce that we have started the Scarlet and Black Project Fund to support diverse students throughout Rutgers University. We will be placing more information about how you can donate in the chat and tune in uh, for all of our wonderful presentations to learn more about that program. Now, let me introduce our chair, Dr. Kendra Boyd, for our program today, The First Black Alumni in Exploration of Scarlet and Black, Volume 2. Dr. Kendra Boyd is an assistant professor at Rutgers University Camden, where she teaches African American history. While she was a doctoral student, she co-authored two chapters of Scarlet and Black, Volume 1. As the inaugural Scarlet and Black postdoctoral associate, Dr. Boyd supervised research that was subsequently published as Scarlet and Black Volume 2, Constructing Race and Gender at Rutgers, 1865 to 1945, which she co-edited with Marissa J. Fuentes and Deborah Gray White. Currently, she is writing a book on Black entrepreneurship and racial capitalism in Great Migration Era Detroit, Michigan. Welcome, Dr. Boyd. Thank you, Dr. Russell, for that introduction. I'm going to start by introducing the other panelists. First, we have Maya Carey. Maya Carey received her PhD from Rutgers University, New Brunswick in, in 2018 and is the Presidential Diversity Postdoctoral Fellow at Binghamton University. In the fall, she will begin her new position at Binghamton as an assistant professor in the Department of History. Dr. Carey began her work with the Scarlet and Black Project as a researcher for volumes one and two, and worked as a project's postdoctoral associate from 2018 to 2019. She continued her connection to the project as a co-editor of Scarlet and Black, volume three. Outside of her work with Scarlet and Black, Dr. Carey's publications include an article in Washington history that explores the relationship between Girl Scouting and the Civil Rights Movement. Her current book project examines the role of social organizations in the coming of age of Black girls in Washington, D.C. in the 20th century. Next, we have Sean Armstead. Sean Armstead is a doctoral candidate and a teaching assistant in the Department of History at Rutgers University, New Brunswick. She was part of the Scarlet and Black research team for the first two volumes in the series. She is currently writing her dissertation on Black women's liberal internationalism in the mid 20th century. And finally, we are thrilled to have a distinguished alumnus with us today, Mr. Bruce Hubbard. Bruce Hubbard is the principal of Bruce A. Hubbard PC, an independent law firm where he has practiced law in New York City. He's a graduate of Rutgers College, class of 1969, and was a member of Kappen School, the senior honorary. He's also a graduate of the Harvard Law School as a Huber Foundation Fellow. Mr. Hubbard was the founding chair of the 100 Black Men of Stamford Incorporated Infinite Scholars Annual College Fair and the founding chair of the Partnership Community Service Project between 100 Black Men of Stamford, Union Baptist Church, and Jack and Jill of America in Stamford, Norwalk, which annually provides hot meals to clients at three Connecticut shelters. Mr. Hubbard is admitted to the bar of the states of Massachusetts and New York and the U.S. District Courts of the Eastern and Southern Districts of New York and the U.S. Supreme Court. 
Thank you to all of our panelists for being here today to share your experience and talk about Black history at Rutgers. So first, we'll just go down the line and talk a little bit about our connection to the history that's covered in Scarlet and Black Volume 2, um, and also any other opening remarks that you would like to share. So I'll start by talking about Scarlet and Black Volume 2. I'll just give a brief overview. So as uh, was mentioned in my bio, I worked on the project since the beginning, Volume 1, as a researcher, and then as a postdoc, led the research for Volume 2, and subsequently co-edited uh, volume two with Marisa Fuentes and Deborah Gray White. Uh, when we started conducting the research for volume two, it was very exciting because volume one did important work of uncovering the ties to slavery and dispossession at the university. And we did the very best that we could to recover the stories of black people themselves and their lives, um, but it was very difficult to do. For volume two, we were able to move into talking about the first Black alums and their experiences, their life and career trajectories. And it was very inspiring, the things that we learned. Of course, there were hardships and tragedies, but overall, what I took away from doing the research is just how inspiring the Black alums at Rutgers and Douglas College have been, and it made me even more proud to, to be a graduate of Rutgers. Uh, so I will just give a, a quick overview of what's covered in volume two. Um, we leave off volume one with slavery and emancipation, the implications for that for African-Americans in New Jersey. Uh, so in volume two, we start by talking about Ilay Walden, who was an enslaved man in North Carolina. And when he gained his freedom, he walked from North Carolina to Washington, D.C. and on to New Jersey. And he was one of the first two Black students to attend the New Brunswick Theological Seminary, which had strong connections to Rutgers and had previously been a part of Queens College before it turned to Rutgers. Uh, so this is how we opened the volume. The book focuses on the period 1865 to 1945 and examines the opportunities and the limitations of freedom for African Americans, both at Rutgers and in New Brunswick more broadly. We have a chapter that examines African Americans in the shadow of Old Queens, highlighting Black life and labor in New Brunswick. We explore the forerunner generation, the first Black alumni at Rutgers College, and also the early decades of Douglas College and the first women of color students there. The book also includes a case study of Rutgers and Douglas alums who were racially ambiguous and or chose to pass as white. The book explores the social activism and race work of black students and alumni at the local, national and international levels. Volume two takes us through the World War II era and sets the stage for the on-campus on student activism that is explored in Scarlet and Black, volume three. Okay, so next we will have Maya Carey who will provide her opening remarks. Thank you, Dr. Boyd. Um, and thank you to everyone for attending today's panel. Um, so um, as Dr. Boyd um, mentioned in her opening remarks, um, I have been a, a participant in the Scarlet and Black Project um, since volume one, first as a researcher, then as a um, postdoctoral associate, um, and then as a co-editor in volume three. Um, another tie that I have to the project, um, one that I'm very proud of is that I am New Jersey born and raised. Um, and I do have family ties to New Brunswick. Um, so being part of this uh, project has felt very personal, but also very exciting to me. Um, so I would like to say a bit more um, about uh, my specific contributions to volume two. 
Um, so I, along with uh, my co-writer, Pamela Walker, um, we wrote the article um, for chapter four, uh, which chronicles the experiences of Douglas College, um, which was originally known as New Jersey College for Women when it, it was founded in 1918. Uh, we chronicled the experiences of the college's first um, Black and non-white students of color, um, as well as doing a little bit of history on some of the first uh, Jewish students at New Jersey College for Women. So I'm just going to briefly kind of talk about what we covered in that piece. Um, so again, although the article focused primarily on Black women, um, we were also able to recover some of the experiences of Douglas's first Puerto Rican and Asian students. So as far as the sources that we used um, to write the piece, um, the University Archive and Special Collections was very crucial to our research. We looked at um, the Red Book, which was the student handbook. We looked at the Queer, uh, which was the New Jersey College Women Yearbook. Um, we looked at the school newspaper, and we also looked at the Chanticleer, which was the humor magazine. Um, and we also looked at previously conducted oral histories. And these sources really allowed us to understand what Black women and other women of color, you know, what they read on campus, how they were thought of by their fellow classmates, et cetera. Um, one aspect of the Scarlet and Black project that I deeply appreciate in each of our volumes, um, but specifically the second and third, um, is our focus on the students themselves. Um, and one of those students um, that we talk about is Veronica Henriksen, um, who was a New Jersey College for Women uh, graduate of the class of 1944. And I'm highlighting Henriksen today because uncovering her story was actually one of the more interesting findings um, of this research for me personally. So I'm going to share my screen. All right, thank you for your patience. <laughs> um, so I actually have pulled up um, the Scarlet and Black Digital Archive. Um, I had the opportunity to do a brief um, exhibition on uh, Veronica Henriksen and the process of finding her. Um, so this is her yearbook photo. Um, and one thing that's interesting about Henriksen, um, so she, uh, was part of the class of 1944. Um, and she was actually like the third known, um, you know, black student at New Jersey College for Women. But as we were reading secondary sources about uh, Douglas College, we found that her name was not mentioned. Um, but after doing digging through um, the yearbook, just kind of like identifying phenotypically uh, people of color, um, also looking at census and draft records. Um, we were able to track down other members of Henriksen's, Hen Henriksen's family um, in the census records. And we came to the conclusion that Veronica Henriksen was indeed a black woman. Um, so it was uh, you know, really fulfilling and exciting to be able to add her name to the list um, of these early black women at Douglas. Um, so I just wanted to briefly mention her. Um, so I will end it there. Um, and I look forward to talking uh, more about some of our findings for this volume. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carey. Next, we have uh, Sean Armstead. Hello everyone, uh, I want to second gratitude uh, for y'all coming to our presentation. Uh, as Professor Boyd mentioned, um, my I am a doctoral candidate in the history department at Rutgers, and I contributed to volumes one and two of Scarlet and Black Project. And really for uh, volume two, I co-authored uh, chapters three and five, and chapter three, right, I particularly contributed uh, research on Edward Lawson, the second black uh, student at Rutgers, uh, Col well, then Rutgers College. And then in chapter five, I discussed, uh, Ju uh, sorry, Julia Baxter Bates, uh, the first black woman uh, known to attend uh, 
NJCW, and then her cousin Malcolm Malcolm Baxter, who attends Rutgers at the same time. And it's actually kind of interesting how that chapter came to be. And I think the story is kind of emblematic of how race functions um, less as a biological fact and more as a destabilizing logic um, at, to some extent. So we know about Julia Baxter Bates, but I found out about her cousin, Malcolm, by accident, really, just by scrolling through uh, yearbooks and seeing his last name as well as the address, which was the same address that Julia Baxter Bates was living at while she attended NJCW, because famously she wasn't allowed to reside on campus, so she had to uh, commute from Newark. And they both, both Baxter's Malcolm and Julia, lived with an aunt in Newark while they attended their respective institutions. And so I really, I think this chapter in a really um, important way highlights how Rutgers uh, contribute, contributed to the kind of efforts to stabilize race and to make it factual and how these two cousins confounded that attempt and that, that goal, that motivation. And so, um, through oral interviews, a census records, uh, images, and newspapers, I kind I came to encounter these these uh, these cousins, and how blackness slips in and slips out of their lives in really crucial moments. Um, through my oral interviews with Malcolm Baxter's relatives, um, surviving relatives, it recalled that. This, that this history, right, is a very, very important to Rutgers University as, as far as the institutional history, but also that it's a family history as well. And I think that is um, kind of where I, I uh, am most interested as far as how this family history becomes uh, in kind of becomes part of Rutgers and how it's this really interwoven kind of um, history that's not always neat. And so I think I will start, stop there and return the stage, so to speak, to Professor Boy. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Armstead. Next, uh, we will have comments from Bruce Hubbard. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here today. Uh, I didn't contribute anything to volume one and two of Scarlet and Black, but I'm here today because Paul Robeson has always been my idol and my lifelong hobby. I have studied him uh, my entire career uh, from the time that I was an undergraduate history student, and I have followed his uh, travels all over uh, the world and traveled to some of the places that he's been and collected memorabilia and books about his life. Um, I was asked to comment about uh, Paul Robeson's impact on subsequent Black students who came in my era in the 1960s and to talk about the differences uh, between the forerunner generation and life at Rutgers and our experiences uh, when we were there. Uh, let me go to my share screen and bring up some photographs that I would like to show in a presentation. Uh, that we have. Okay, great. So the first picture I want to show is a picture of the Buskill family. Uh, Paul Robeson was very fortunate because he came from a very prominent Philadelphia family. The picture that you can see is of Paul Robeson's uh, grandfather, uh, Charles Hicks Bustill, and his aunt, Gertrude Emily Bustill, and his mother, Maria Louisa Bustill. The Bustills were a prominent Philadelphia family, and his great-grandfather was actually a baker who baked for George Washington and his troops during the American Revolution. Maria Luisa Bustill was college-educated and was a school teacher before her death in a fire in 1904. Now, Paul's father similarly uh, had been born a slave, uh, but after freedom was educated and had a college degree from, from Lincoln University. So Paul did not come from a typical black family uh, when he was born in 1898. Uh, this is a picture of Paul uh, on the football team at Rutgers. 
uh, as a freshman, uh, a gentleman named Harry Rockefeller, who opposed him being on the team, actually after he was tackled, uh, spiked his hand and pulled out all of the fingernails in one finger, on one hand. Uh, Paul stayed with that team and was successful as its only black player and was a two-time All-American uh, during his time at Rutgers. Uh, he was an example for us because there were very few black students uh, at, at Rutgers when he was there. When, when I was there in the 1960s, there were at least 50 of us, uh, I guess, during my years and probably more by the time I was a senior. But Paul had a support group. This picture shows Paul with friends while he was an undergraduate at Rutgers. And you'll notice that a lot of the friends in these pictures have on military uniforms, which means in the period from 1915 to 1919, uh, they were in both the Navy and the Army. In the picture on the right, you see Paul on the left and the four gentlemen who were his friends, two were in the Navy and two were in the Army. And then you see a picture of Paul with uh, some women friends while he was an undergraduate. And I was fortunate enough to know one of these women who had dated Paul uh, and his friends when uh, he was in college. So despite the fact that he was one of very few black students, he did have a social life uh, that was unrelated to the university. This is a picture of Paul uh, in the debating society. And Paul was a champion debater in addition to being a singer and an athlete and a scholar. Uh, he won every debating competition that he was in during his whole four years at Rutgers. Uh, Paul's senior graduation picture and Paul being inducted into uh, Cap and Skull in 1919. Uh, this is interesting because both Jerry Harris in the class of 69 and I were inducted in the Cap and Skull 50 years after uh, Paul was. And it was interesting to see uh, the listings in the book uh, 50 years later. Paul originally, most people don't know, attended NYU Law School and after he met Islanda, Islanda Cardozo Good, who subsequently became his wife, uh, she, she was a graduate student at Columbia and, and he transferred to Columbia. You can see this picture in the uh, inset. Uh, Paul doesn't look very happy. Uh, his uh, years at Columbia, which were the last two, uh, he uh, was pretty isolated, was the only black in the class. Uh, Paul got a full scholarship to Rutgers, uh, but at Columbia, uh, he had to finance it on his own. So he dropped out and coached football at Lincoln University and played pro football to finance the remaining years of his law school career. And afterwards, he went to a major law firm on Wall Street where he was not treated uh, properly in terms of having client contact and encouraged by his then wife, as Wanda, left and went off into a career of acting and singing. This is Eslanda and Paul coming back from their first trip to Europe in 1927. Uh, she was a major power and manager of his career. Uh, she had attended uh, the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana and a graduate student at Columbia and uh, was a major factor in his uh, political career. She had two brothers who uh, left the United States and moved to the Soviet Union in the 1930s and were very active politically, both in Pan-Africanism and in the Caribbean. The second picture of Paul after he retrieved his passport and was able to travel again uh, in London in 1959. And finally, this is a picture of Paul with Nikita Khrushchev in uh, Yalta in the Crimea in 1958. Uh, Paul was active with the Soviet Union and uh, had his son educated partially there. And this was part of the reason for his persecution because his affiliation with Russia because of their professed uh, uh, equal treatment of Blacks around the world. I'll stop there and uh, be available to listen for questions later on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hubbard. Okay, so can all of our panelists please turn on their cameras and microphones so that we can be together and have a conversation. So, Thank you so much for your opening remarks. They were very insightful and I hope we can have a lively discussion. So I wanted to start out by asking a question for um, Maya and Sean. I mean, Dr. Carey and Professor Armstead, if you can talk a little bit about 
the first women at what would become Douglas College and the way that their combined gender and race shaped their experience at Douglas and in New Brunswick. Um, I'm happy to start off with answering that question. Um, yeah, so as you, um, you know, gestured to in your question, um, Black women and women of color were at Douglas were constrained not only um, by their race, but also by gender um, and ideas about gender. So, I mean, to give like a couple of examples of, you know, like kind of like what it would have been like um, to be a student of color at Douglas um, in these early years or before uh, World War II. Um, for example, and I believe that um, this was mentioned in the opening remarks, um, but uh, Black women were not allowed to live on campus um, until 1946. Um, that's when Evelyn Sermons Field and Emma Warren Andrews, um, they became the first Black women to live on campus. So that was in 1946, um, so nearly 30 years after the creation of the college um, and nearly you know, like 16 years after the first known Black woman to enter the, the campus. Um, and, and as I mentioned, they weren't restrained just by race, but also by gender. So uh, one thing that we looked at in our research was the Red Book, uh, which was the student handbook. And you see how um, students, you know, regardless of their race, um, because they, they were women, their movements were literally like constrained. So there were rules about what restaurants they could patronize in downtown New Brunswick without a chaperone. But if we think about during that period, what that could have been for a black woman who, uh, because of dis discriminatory practices that she might have faced um, by business owners in New Brunswick, she's already kind of constricted in places where, where she could go. Um, so I hope that that's clear. Um, and then, you know, um, yes, and then women at NJC. Uh, they both created um, and were also subject to racist imagery on campus, which has been documented in the Chanticleer, which was a humor magazine and the queer. Um, so I wanna share my screen briefly, um, an image in the 1941 queer yearbook. Um, so as we see here, this was a photograph taken during Parents' Day. Um, this photograph appears in volume two. Um, and we have members of the junior class participating in the 1941 Parents' Day. And if you see the student who's the second from the left, um, you can see that she's dressed as a mammy in blackface. And this is 1941. So students like Veronica Henriksen would have been on campus when this happened. Um, so you can imagine how, uh, you know, traumatizing that likely was. Um, and then another thing that I want to add, um, you know, one thing that I found interesting was that these women often, um, these Black women were, were often very involved on campus. So despite the fact that they couldn't live on campus, they still were active participants in student organizations, uh, you know, like the, the Glee Club or student government. Um, so they, they were heavily involved and seemed to be well-liked by their peers. Um, it doesn't mean that they didn't experience microaggressions. Um, but one thing that was interesting is that unlike uh, you know, the early Black male students at Rutgers that are discussed in chapter three of the volume, um, Black women seem to have been less vocal about experiencing racism on campus and seem to have been a little bit less militant about addressing these issues. Um, and there are a couple of reasons for this. Um, one that I'll mention just is socialization um, and the idea that Black girls uh, and specifically ones that enter these mixed race spaces are, are often told to be nice and to appear open and friendly as a way to mark their femininity, but also um, as a way to, um, to uh, like move along the progress of equality um, 
and tolerance. Um, so I think that could be kind of like a difference between why we see Rutgers men being a, a, a little bit more vocal. Um, but those are just some examples. Yeah, so speaking specifically about Julia Baxter Bates, um, is, so she she gets sent to NJCW by an accident, right? She's actually mistaken for white. And upon her arrival at the campus, according to her recollection, they try to tell her to go home, right? It's really like her father that makes, like insists that she stays. But the response, right, from NJC, as far as trying to restabilize you know, this kind of racial system that she had confounded or destabilized is that she can't stay on campus. And kind of similar to what Professor Carey was talking about, right, that the, Julia Baxter Bates was very reluctant to talk about her experiences with race, with racism on campus. In fact, um, I kind of had to read between the lines. So at this point in, uh, in like yearbook publications, they're actually listing like every, like not just their addresses next to their images, but also like what all groups they were part of and some of their interests. And she wasn't a part of any groups, despite being very interested in French. She wasn't part of the French club. She wasn't part of you know, soccer. Like She didn't play soccer on campus. And that could very well be because she wasn't able to live on campus, which would have completely shaped her ability to be part of extracurricular activities. But it could also very well have been because of racial intolerance which you know, she did briefly mention that she received I am, a poor grade for not uh, reciting a, a poem, right, in, in the Southern dialect. Or, you know, there were also plays with Black minstrelsy. Um, I believe the year before she attended, there was a Sambo character where a white student at NJC not only uh, performed this caricature of Blackness, but also transgressed gender. So it's really interesting when we kind of consider how race and gender are combining to shape uh, Julia Baxter Bates' experiences as the first known Black woman to attend in JCW and how we compare that to some of the earlier Black alumni that attended Rutgers College. Yep. Paul Robeson was so much better than everyone else that he didn't have that issue. He was a better athlete when he was attacked on the football field he basically beat up the other players so badly that the coach took him aside and said, okay, you're on the team, even though they didn't want him there. And he lettered all four years in football, basketball, and baseball. Uh, he won every oratorical contest. He was the valedictorian of the class. He was Phi Beta Kappa. Uh, he you know, became a concert singer and sang with the Glee Club, but was not permitted to travel with them and sing when they went to certain universities. Uh, there was one game that he was not uh, per permitted to play in because the other team would not play against him. But Paul did not have the problem that a lot of people have because basically he was a six foot three man who demonstrated academically, physically, uh, oratorically, artistically, that he was superior, he was a Renaissance man. Now, when Paul went to New York, it was a different situation. And he didn't get the financing at NYU that he got at Rutgers. And living near NYU because it's downtown was an issue that led to him transferring to Columbia, which is in Harlem. And as Londa encouraged him to do that because one, his living arrangements were easier. And he joined the uh, Provincetown players at her insistence and performed at the Harlem Y on 135th Street. And after he graduated and worked at a major Wall Street law firm, they, they would bring clients in to talk with him about sports, but they didn't want him to have client contact in meetings about legal work. And Paul got very quickly frustrated with that. And at the, with the encouragement of his wife, he left and, uh, and left the law and went off and pursued a career uh, that made him even more famous and, and, and more successful in acting and singing and as a political leader around the world. Thank you. I think 
all of these comments are very useful for understanding the different experiences of women students and men students who were attending uh, Rutgers and Douglas at the same time um, and what the different expectations were. Dr. Carey, you mentioned that part of being, you know, the right type of feminine is to be nice and to not speak out versus for the male students, they have this expectation that not only do, do you need to be a Rutgers man uh, and all the masculine ideals that that entail, but you also need to be a race man and fight to uplift your race and fight for, for justice. So there were completely different expectations. And I like how the book tries to show the way that both groups of students navigated these, these terrains. Um, we have one, one question in the chat that I wanted to ask. Uh, it's from Beatrice Adams. And it said, could the panelists say more about the politics of passing at Rutgers and more broadly, specifically in addition to the clear benefit, what are some of the losses? I think this is mostly uh, for Sean to answer since you wrote about that in your chapter. I forgot to unmute myself, my bad y'all. Hi Beatrice. Uh, so to your question, definitely. Uh, so I try to kind of grapple with the, the loss kind of component to that in the chapter. Um, and I think that really comes out with Malcolm Baxter and his story. So it's important because, right, so through my oral interviews, right, with his, um, with his surviving children, uh, we kind of touched on how does blackness kind of disappear, right? Because one, I didn't, he wasn't part of the list of black alumni. And as I mentioned in my earlier comments, I found, I found out about Malcolm Baxter being at Rutgers by accident. Um, and when I, you know, did, uh, did research, I found one of his sons, they said that they didn't know that their father was, was black. Right, or I'm sorry, his grandchild, that they didn't realize that their grandfather was black. And then I spoke to an aunt, and really this kind of, from what I gathered from the oral interviews, it doesn't really disappear, right? Like this man's racial identity doesn't kind of drop out until the family expands with marriages, right? And you know, I think they're still kind of grappling with, um, what that what that means right so with his daughter Malcolm Baxter's daughter she mentioned that there was loss and a sense of regret there so I think um as far as passing I don't necessarily believe that Malcolm Baxter chose that voluntarily at all I think that there were personal politics as it related to new incoming members and so I think that it is important that Yes, there are clear advantages, as the question indicates, as far as um, passing, right, as far as survival. But I think Malcolm Baxter reminds us in this really um, painful, but also clear way that there are some pretty tangible losses as well. If you go back and look at the history and the photographs of all of the HBCUs, uh, Howard, uh, Morehouse, Spellman, et cetera, and you look at the early graduates, you will see that they're composed of what are a lot of the children uh, who are mulatto. And if you look at the early records of who worked in Washington, D.C. for the federal government, you will see that there were a lot of people who disappeared. In every Black family probably in the United States, you have relatives who moved from the South who were able to pass, and moved north of the Mason-Dixon line, obtained jobs and employment, sent money home for a little while, married into the white world, and then it became dangerous and disappeared. I know we have that in my family and we've been able to trace it. And if you go through a lot of black families, you see that as an issue. You know, some people get angry and say that, you know, that wasn't right, but in the context of the late 19th century, uh, you can't blame people for moving in their best interest in a world that was segregated. Uh, so, I mean, it's, a, it's an unfortunate fact, but it's, it's true generally in, in the United States. Thank you. We have um, Jesse in the Q&A who would like to open his mic and ask a question. 
Hey, uh, thank you so much uh, for your presentations today. And I think it's really, especially for uh, Mr. Hubbard, so great to see these images of Paul Robeson with his other black friends who are not at Rutgers, because I think it really reminds us of the coping um, strategies that people had when they were the only person on campus who's black. And I'm wondering if when we're thinking about that uh, generation of students and who were the only one on campus, so they didn't get a chance to really connect with other black students while they were at Rutgers, maybe there was one more person, um, but who wasn't even in the same class as them. But do I'm wondering for the researchers, if you could talk a little bit about what you found in the archive in terms of the connections between the different Black Rutgers alumni across the generations, across different classes, did it mean something to be a Rutgers alum who is Black, even if, um, you, you know, even if you're not meeting up with somebody in your own class, uh, did people connect across uh, the different generations? Yeah, for, for instance, Paul Robeson had a, a black roommate uh, who was an underclassman, uh, I think, uh, after uh, his freshman year. I can't remember his name, but I, I remember reading about him in Barbara Ramsey's book, As Wanda. And Paul became friends with uh, people like Fritz Pollard. Fritz Pollard was a black football player at Brown who played a couple of years ahead of him, who he played against. And... Uh, Fritz became the football coach at Lincoln University and invited Paul to help coach with him and play there uh, after they graduated, which helped Paul pay for his uh, law school career. And Paul also played professional football uh, in uh, Wisconsin, I think, in Marquette, uh, when Fritz was the coach there. So there were, Paul went along with a lot of Blacks to work in Narragansett Bay in the summertime. People would work there at restaurants um, and, and make money for their college careers. And a lot of black college students who were at white universities got to know each other during that summer employment and had relationships uh, that they fostered even after they graduated from, uh, from college. Uh, the first uh, you know, black um, 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 students who went to Princeton uh, were, were part of this in, in, the, in the late 1940s. Uh, Woodrow Wilson kept Paul from uh, going to Princeton. And even in the 1930s, when Judge Bruce Wright was admitted, thinking he was white when he arrived, they, they turned him back. And I think the first black student at Princeton uh, didn't matriculate until 1949. So Rutgers was way, way ahead. And so was Harvard, who had, I guess, its first black student graduated in the in 1860s. So uh, there was a way that some of these students knew each other. And when I was in college in the 1960s, uh, there were 15 in my class. Five of us graduated uh, together in 1969, but they had something called Black Student Conferences across the East Coast. And, and everyone from Howard to Bowdoin in Maine would get together three times a year at, at Princeton and Harvard and Yale. And we would have a conference and everyone would know each other. And it was great because we got to learn about graduate school opportunities and uh, where other students were. I mean, I, I remember meeting students from the Ivy League and comparing grades and, and SATs with them and wondering why I hadn't applied to the Ivy League because no one encouraged me. And this type of meet and greet across borders uh, created a network that increased the numbers of black students who went through majority schools. That's uh, really fascinating. I just wanted to add that you know, in, our, in our book, when we're studying um, these first alums, we do look at Paul Robeson and also James Dixon Carr, who was the first Black graduate of Rutgers. And it seems like they had some sort of mentorship. Um, what, as you mentioned, Mr. Hubbard, Paul was prevented from playing in a football game. And when James Dixon Carr found out about it, he wrote an angry letter to the president defending Robeson and scolding Rutgers basically for not living up to their own ideals of honor and civility. Uh, and it seems that maybe this relationship continued uh, because when James Dixon Carr died in 1920, just a year after Paul Robeson graduated from Rutgers, 
Paul Robeson served as a pallbearer at James Dixon Carr's funeral. So it's clear, even though they graduated, um, they weren't at Rutgers at the same time, clearly they must have had some relationship. And I assume there was some mentoring that, that happened as a result of that. Dr. Carey, were you going to add a comment? Yes, yeah, so I just wanted to um, add to Mr. Hubbard's comments and say that, you know, these relationships at uh, in JCW and Douglas um, were very similar where, um, you know, especially I, I saw this a lot in the third volume where women that came in in the 1960s, you know, like they see women that came before them as not just like friends and mentors, but also as models. Um, and another thing that I would like to add is that um, Emma Andrews Warren, um, who was one, one of the first Black women to live on campus, her sister was actually a graduate of NJCW. Um, so it does seem like there are, you know, some sort of like familial ties um, and just the importance of the New Brunswick community itself. Um, or as if they didn't have that community like on campus, they could also turn to institutions um, off campus as well. You know, we had available to us um, uh, alumni uh, from the 1930s, uh, like John Morrow. John Morrow had been ambassador under uh, Kennedy and Johnson uh, to several countries in Africa. And his brother, Frederick Morrow, was the first black to work as a presidential advisor in the White House under uh, President Eisenhower. And he came back to campus and was a uh, visiting professor while I was an undergraduate. We had CLR James, who was famous from the Caribbean, come and teach while we were there. Uh, there was a professor at uh, Princeton whose name escapes me now, uh, Sir, uh, Sir Arthur, I can't remember his last name, but he uh, would come to Rutgers from Princeton and teach. So during all those years, Shirley Graham Du Bois was around and would come in and lecture. Uh, even though uh, W.B. Du Bois had passed away. We, we were very fortunate in terms of the people that we got access to. And, uh, you know, there were magazines and things like Freedom Ways and, and publications and, and, uh, and, and uh, things in having access to New York because we were at Rutgers was also an advantage. Now, people don't realize that on Jamel Terrace, where Paul Robeson lived, James Walden Johnson, the first black woman uh, D.A. In, uh, in New York who convicted uh, Lucky Luciano and Paul Robeson were all next door neighbors uh, on Jamel Terrace. I mean, there has always been a network, especially in Harlem, of people who uh, were educated and were involved in civil rights. Okay, I have in the queue a comment from um, Valerie Anderson, if you'd like to unmute yourself and um, give your comment. Um, good afternoon. First of all, thank you all so very much. I am absolutely enjoying this. I've enjoyed being a part of uh, whatever the Associate Alumni of Douglas College could provide in terms of the research. But I just wanted to kind of point out that I had the personal opportunity to, to talk with and to know Evelyn Sermon Spiel, class of 49, who passed away in 2015. And of course, Emma, um, Emma Andrews uh, Warren, class of 49, who to our knowledge is the oldest living uh, black Douglas alumna. And uh, I just wanted to share in terms of the comments about you know, the activism while they were students on campus. And I wanna just say that I, you know, in talking to them, uh, they were well aware of their environment and it was a thing of survival and also was very strategic of them in terms of uh, what the, how they, if you want to say maneuvered and operated um, on campus as students. Um, and remember their intent was to get an education against everything that didn't want them to have an education. Um, and so they used their voices in other ways. Evelyn was very involved um, outside of her academic world. Um, having been raised in Somerville, she knew Paul Roberson. Paul Roberson graduated from Somerville High School. And so that involvement, and as was already said with Paul Roberson being a voice um, it kind of helped her and then of course the urban league because it was really the urban league pressure um, on Rutgers in terms of getting them to be able to live on campus. Um, and so they used their resources, but I just wanted to kind of point out that don't view them as weak. They were far from weak in terms of their approach to 
um, being, you know, some of the first black students uh, at uh, NJC and now what is Douglas. So just wanted to share that information. You know, I, I wanted to echo that uh, because I know that uh, I knew Miss Sermons also, and I, I can't remember the, the young woman's name. Uh, um, her name was Bessie, and she was from Newark, and she was on the Board of Governors. And I know she was a great support to us during the time that we were undergraduates. A lot of the women who graduated from Douglas remained in New Jersey and were involved in education. Uh, pe people like Bernice Venable and uh, other people who are still around today. Uh, they were the backbone as most women are in most organizations that blacks have. Uh, the people who you could count on to make certain that the organization continued and operated the way that it was supposed to do. Uh, and so they were always there with support with an institution that you could count on that would carry forth from, from one year to the next. I just wanted to just say in response to Ms. Anderson, thank you for your comment. And I don't know, my, uh, Dr. Carey, maybe you're about to shout yes, out the AADC. Probably. Okay, you can shout out the AADC. <laughs> yes, you. the AADC was so crucial in getting this research done. And they were, uh, Ms. Anderson and her team were just so generous with their time and with their resources. And we truly couldn't have written you know, this chapter or the work that we did in volume three without their help. Um, so I just want to like publicly thank Ms. Anderson and, and the AADC. Um, again, like their contributions were so crucial. And just to echo, like I completely agree. Um, I, I definitely don't see <clears throat> Um, Evelyn Sermons Field um, or Miss Warren as passive. You know, in fact, I think that they were not, not I, I think I know that they were able to expand how we think of as, as the Douglas woman. So the Douglas woman is not just, you know, a white middle class Protestant woman, but they kind of they expanded what it uh, meant to be a Douglas woman. So just want to add that. OK, I have sort of a broad question. Um, so can the panelists please provide uh, their insight on how they think the first black alum, of what do they think the first black alumni tell us about the black experience at Rutgers and in New Brunswick more broadly? Well, I mean, they set a, a, a standard uh, both the women at Douglas and the, the men who were at Rutgers, uh, that was a goal for those of us who came behind us. The people who were early forerunners were all outstanding students. They didn't get the opportunity unless they were. So there were, there were no mediocre students, uh, male or female, uh, in the forerunner class. Uh, we uh, started in the 1960s and bringing in larger numbers. And we have had more social activity and support in terms of having other people of color there. Uh, when I attended Rutgers, by way of example, in my class of about 1,100, there were 15 Blacks. Uh, everyone else was a white male. There were no Latinos. There were no Asians. There were no Indians. Uh, there was no, there were no women. Uh, and, uh, you know, now records is very diverse in all those areas. And uh, even with 15 people in our class, I started and spent my first two years in pre-med, I would spend whole days at the Heights campus in what was formerly uh, Camp Kilmer in bio and chem labs and never see another black person. Uh, so, and one interesting thing, when you talk about the housing, we were in, uh, uh, the Broward Commons one day sitting at a black table as freshmen. And we said, what room are you in? 4224 Mettler. What room? 4224 Tinsley. Whoever the person was who assigned our rooms had no imagination. And you could find a black student in room 424 in each of the freshman dorms, which was sort of hilarious when you think about the way that they organized where we lived. Uh, and, uh, you know, at least that way they could know where, where each of us was. Uh, which is sort of an interesting thing. Uh, a lot of the issues that they had among the forerunners, we still had uh, years later. And the comfort feeling and the feeling of ease and being on the campus, I think 
did not come until larger numbers of students arrived. So I think I'll comment on, on that question as well. Um, I think personally for me, uh, the alumni experiences that we uncover or that we present rather and volume two highlights that just the inclusion can potentially be a dangerous thing. And what I mean by that is that yes, like Rutgers did have black students, students of color, and yet these students had to survive a great deal, right? Even exceptional cases like Paul Robeson, right? As Mr. Hubbard outlines. And I think with Julia Baxter Bates, even though she wasn't, she didn't explain in full, right? She wasn't ex ex especially revealing about uh, the trials and tribulations she had to cross while at NJC, she does go on to be an activist, right? She ends up working at an HBCU. She ends up contributing to research uh, for the Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka case, right? I think a lot of that has to do with her experiences at Rutgers and how they shaped her. And I think uh, another student uh, that I didn't spend too much time talking about today, Edward Lawson, he, he's the second black student at Rutgers, right, after Carr. And it's a family affair to get him in, right? They, he's, he's a mess, he's writing Rutgers admins, asking them for additional uh, kind of lessons to prepare for his transition to Rutgers. He's very active at Rutgers as far as um, student culture, as far as clubs and sports. And then his final year, he's able to live on campus and he gets accused of theft during his senior year. And he's ex essentially expelled, right? So I think that for, I guess, the takeaway personally for me, and I'd be interested to hear everyone else's takeaway from their experiences with researching, is that um, it's, yes, there were Black students, but there's, there's a painful history there. There's a history of racism there as well. Yeah, I um, agree with all of the points that have been made. Um, and I, I think to um, kind of piggyback off of a more recent comment about the trajectory of, you know, the forerunner generation, um, speaking about students at Douglas, they went on to do very, you know, wonderful things. Um, and I guess a relationship that I see between a lot of the NJC graduates is this commitment to service. And a lot of them maintain ties to NJC and to Douglas post-graduation through alumni net networks. Um, so it's like they were still doing work to make the institution a better place um, even after they left. Um, so I, 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 I think that speaks to, you know, while their experience at NJC was very formative, um, they also probably saw areas where the institution could be better um, and put themselves in position to make those changes. Okay, we have two questions in the chat. I'm going to ask both of them and these will be the, the last questions before we end the panel. So we have, um, question from Deborah Gray White, Board of Governors Distinguished Professor, uh, wants to know, can you say a bit about how you think this experience affected your careers as scholars? Do any of the experiences that you researched parallel with yours or was your academic experience very different? We also have a question from Carrie Rael. I'd like to ask a question about the first Puerto Rican and other women of color alumni Alumna, alumnae at Douglas and how their experiences were similar or different to the Black Douglas alumnae? Let me, let me respond to, to both of those. Uh, the first Puerto Rican uh, student at Rutgers that I know is a guy named Jose Torres. And he was in my class and we were good friends. And he didn't have a peer group. And I think I talked about this when we had Blacks on the Banks in 2015. Uh, he was from Patterson, uh, New Jersey, and he became black for the four years that he was at Rutgers because he didn't have another choice. And uh, 
he went on to Columbia Law School and became an attorney. And uh, when I first moved back to uh, New York from, uh, from Boston, after practicing there for three years, we often had lunch, and I, I think I've recently lost contact with him, but he's still an attorney in New York. Uh, but there was no large Hispanic grouping in the 1960s that, that came later. Uh, with respect to the, uh, the effect on our careers, um, I was inspired by all of the people who came before, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to become a lawyer. I didn't have the capabilities to do half the things that Paul Robeson did. If, if I could sing, I would probably have wanted to be a singer like him. Uh, but since I can't, I, I went to law school. <laughs> and and I, I couldn't uh, throw a ball like him or play a sport like him. So I, I picked the one that I could do. Uh, but they've all been inspirational and they've all been uh, very helpful uh, in terms of our careers. And we're all very proud of the people who uh, were the forerunners at Rutgers. And I'm also proud of the people that I went to school with. Uh, uh, I don't know if, if uh, we have time, but there, and I don't want to go into the uh, student protest period, but uh, of the people who graduated during my period, we have a group called Black on the Banks Legacy Circle. And we're very proud of the doctors and PhDs and professors, et cetera, that came out of that group. Um, most of those guys were very successful. We recently lost a guy named Greg Scott, who was the first Black Supreme Court justice in, in Colorado. And we've got quite a few judges and uh, very successful people who came out of the 1960s, early 1970s. So we're very proud. I see actually that um, Dr. White is unmuted. Do you want to say or comment or question? Well, I was just thinking that um, both Maya and Sean, you know, um, uh, you're, you're young scholars and um, presumably things that change uh, at different uni at the universities that you went to right before you uh, came to Rutgers. But so I, I, I had two questions for you for you all. If I wanted to know how this research has affected your career as scholars and now as budding um, young uh, professors. And I'd also like to know whether or not um, your experience was similar to that of the previous or previous generations. If you, uh, or, or did you find that this forerunner generation that we are talking about in volume two, uh, whether you went to Rutgers or not, whether you know they really laid a foundation for you so that you didn't have to endure a lot of the, a lot of the problems and, and conflicts that they experience. Thank you for that question. I will address the, um, the parallel experiences. Um, so I did undergrad at a small liberal arts college in suburban New Jersey, um, predominantly white institution. Um, and I, I think some of the structural issues that shaped the forerunner generation that shaped their experiences. Um, some of those issues still exist maybe in different ways um, when I was in undergrad. Um, and again, like I went to a, a predominantly white institution. So I think just like, you know, women that came through Douglas College, how important it was for them to have a community of women, um, you know, that looked like them and could share their experiences. It was vital to my experience as an undergraduate student um, and made me feel more included and less isolated in a campus that's like otherwise, there's not a lot of people that look like me. Um, and in terms of how this has um, affected my career as a scholar, I think one uh, thing that the Scarlet and Black Project has taught me is the importance of uh, how our work exists outside of the classroom or outside of an academic text. But, you know, the different ways that we can bring our work to a larger public um, and the importance of that work. Um, and I'm really grateful uh, for the Scarlet and Black Project giving me those tools, you know, working on my own uh, 
scholarship is how can I make this more public facing? I just wanted to add on to Dr. Carey's point. Um, I didn't go to undergrad in New Jersey, but I got my PhD. And it for me was so important, you know, as a first generation college student, as a black woman to go to a PhD program where there were black professors. And I know that this is only possible because of the activism that took place in the 1960s and the 1970s um, so that people like Deb Gray White <laughs> could create a field for Black women's history that we can then come and not be the only one studying it. So definitely I appreciate the activism of college students earlier on. In terms of my career, Scarlet and Black has been so useful and helpful for me to de develop my research skills, um, help me on the job market. And I'm still using the Scarlet and Black Project now that I'm a professor to teach students at Rutgers Camden. And, um, you know, it's so important for them to know the history around them, not only at Rutgers, but in New Jersey, because it really is lacking the focus on Black New Jersey history. And I'm just so grateful to, to be a part of this project. And to follow up on uh, Dr. Carey and Dr. Boyd's comments, um, definitely yes, and all of that for me too. I went to undergrad in Alabama. And when I came to Rutgers, I, I I received a space I didn't actually know I really needed. Um, as far as examples of brilliant, capable Black women who were leaders in their fields and really brilliant Black women graduate students who offered amazing examples as far as with their scholarship, but also being in coursework. And yes, I definitely agree that that legacy, right, that I have been so grateful to benefit from is definitely part of this history. It's a culmination of the history that we've been talking about today that we covered more deeply in all three volumes of this project. Um, and so like, I think personally as a scholar, uh, this was the first time I had to encounter um, subjects who could speak back to me. Um, my, the, the subjects I study in my dissertation they've passed, right? Um, I don't have the benefit of having, of being able to talk with them, of being able to ask them questions. And I think with the oral interviews that I had to conduct, one, it was exciting because I'd never conducted an oral interview before, but it was also uh, uncomfortable, right? Because for me, this was, a, I, I'm a historian, I'm a researcher, but for the people I interviewed, these were, this was, their father and their aunt and they were talking, they were, they were open enough, they were trusting enough to share with me um, experiences that for me were part of history, but for them was their lives. And I found myself being very uncomfortable about asking questions and be wanting to make them feel comfortable. So I think uh, it helped me kind of understand more fully the responsibility I owe to the subjects I study, even though they're not here, to contest or to encourage. I think his, it's my responsibility as a historian to present the people I study as full people and not just folks to motive, to kind of move the narrative that I'm interested in telling, but that they end up being fully uh, developed people in how I present them. But yeah. That's it for me. Okay, thank you. So we do have a follow-up question from Dr. Marisa Fuentes. So it's a follow-up question from Carrie's earlier question. Maya, can you briefly talk about uh, Puerto Rican women at Douglas? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so with the second volume, you um, came across uh, two Puerto Rican women. 
um, who were at Douglas, you know, um, they came in roughly around the same time in like around the 19, in, in the 1930s, like the early 1930s. Um, and unfortunately, as I was doing research, um, I didn't find out a great deal about them. Um, unfortunately, the paper trail kind of runs um, cold. Um, I do know one of them. It's not clear that she uh, graduated from NJC. Um, she enrolled, but it's not clear if she graduated. Um, and then uh, there was a student by the name of Amelia Caballero, um, who's a student from Puerto Rico. And again, I, I believe she came in around 1932. Um, and we don't know um, a lot about her, but similar to uh, the Black women that we cover in the chapter, it does appear that she was, you know, very much involved in campus life. Um, I believe that she lived on campus. Um, so it seemed like she had more so like a typical uh, um, experience. Um, but again, that's not to say that she didn't experience like microaggressions. Um, it's just that we uh, didn't uncover it in our research. So unfortunately, I don't have much information to give. Um, and that's kind of, you know, when you're researching these people, you know, sometimes it's like so hard to find additional information. Um, but she was one of the earlier students. And it was very likely that she might have been the only one. Um, so we can kind of like reconstruct what that might have been for her coming from Puerto Rico. Um, you know, did she feel isolated at NJC? Those types of questions. Thank you, Maya. So I'll wrap up the panel. I want to say thank you to all of our panelists, Dr. Maya Carey, Sean Armstead, PhD candidate in history at Rutgers, New Brunswick, and our distinguished alumnus, Mr. Bruce Hubbard, class of 1969. This was a great conversation. Thank you also to the audience for attending. I wanna shout out again, the Scarlet and Black Book Fund. Um, I gave to the book fund this morning, it felt great. So if you can give, please give. Um, many students of color, undergraduates, they struggle to pay for the books that they need to do their studies. It's an impediment. So anything that you can give will help. So we'll wrap up and our next panel is a keynote. Our keynote actually is with Rutgers President Jonathan Holloway later today at 6 p.m.